New Testament reading today comes from the book of Philippians chapter 3, the first 11 verses. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me, and for you it is a safeguard. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ to have no confidence in the flesh, even though, too, I have reasons for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I have, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. And he found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God be with us this day. May the words we hear be your words. And may we have the strength and courage to put your words into practice now and always. Amen. There was a man who went to the doctor because <coughs> he just didn't feel right. Something was wrong. The doctor ran all the tests that he could and he finally had to tell the man that he had a bad illness and he only had a year to live. After the shock wore off, the man decided to talk to his wise friend. His friend was the smartest person he knew, and everyone in the, ca the town came to him for advice because his credentials and his reputation were impeccable. After the man explained his situation, he asked his friend if there was anything that he could suggest that he could do. His friend said the following, Go out and sell your fancy Mercedes. Buy a late 70s or an early 80s model Dodge pickup truck. Then go get married to the meanest, plainest, and most undesirable woman you can find. Buy yourselves an old house trailer and move it to the panhandle of Oklahoma. The fellow asked, will this help me live longer? And his wise friend said, no, but it'll make the time you have seem like forever. <laughs> Sometimes we listen to those who seem to be wise and knowledgeable. Sometimes we give a lot of weight and credit to those who have impressive degrees or credentials. And sometimes their advice can be groundbreaking and other times it can be like the wise man in our story. Today we read a scripture in which Paul feels it's necessary to list all of his credentials, all of his achievements. In verse 2, Paul states, Beware of the dogs because of the evil workers, because of those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God, who boast in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Paul is attacking the claim that many Jewish Christians believe if Gentiles were going to follow Christ, they first had to submit to the Old Testament laws particularly the one that stated that the right of circumcision was necessary for salvation. Paul countered this assertion by explaining that the follower of Christ is the person who worships the Spirit of God. It is the person who boasts not what he or she has done, but what Christ has done for him or her. And it is the person who puts confidence in no human things, meaning it is not the performance or duties that earns a person's salvation, it is only the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. 
And before anyone could say to Paul, you don't know what you're talking about because you are not Jewish, he laid out his credentials. So let's take a moment and look at them. He had been circumcised eight days after his birth. This went back to God's command to Abraham. This became a law of Israel. Paul makes this claim to show that he was born into the Jewish faith. He was an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin. This tribe was esteemed because Israel's first king had been from that tribe, and Benjamin was only one of two tribes to return to Israel after the exile. So of his credentials so far, Barclay says that Paul claims that from his birth he was a God-fearing, law-observing Jewish person whose lineage was as pure as Jewish lineage could be and that he belonged to the most aristocratic tribe that there was. Now you would think that showing his birth and pedigree would be enough and if there was ever any doubt to his Jewish lineage, it had now been dispelled. But wait, Paul's not finished. He just listed the privileges that came to him by birth, and next he lists his achievements in the Jewish faith. A Hebrew born of Hebrews. The Jewish people had been dispersed throughout the known world, and even though they were Jewish persons, wherever one would go, they would find a Jewish person of the faith, most of them forgot their language and became Greek-speaking because of the environment in which they lived. A Hebrew was a Jewish person who was not only of pure racial descent, but who had deliberately retained and could speak Hebrew. Paul was born in the Gentile city of Tarsus, but he was a pure-blood Jewish individual. As to the law of Pharisee, the Pharisees were an elite group. The Pharisee is a word that means the separated ones. There was never more than 6,000 Pharisees at any one time, but they were the spiritual elite of Judaism. They devoted their lives to knowing every nuance of the law, every minute detail. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Zeal was an important part of the Jewish life. It was the hallmark of religious Life. To have zeal was to have a fervor, a passion for God, and it meant that you love God. It showed that you love God with all your heart. And as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul is stating that there is no demand of the law that he did not fulfill. He lived following the law as he was supposed to do. Once again, Bartley sums this up by saying Paul was so loyal to the Jewish way of life that he never lost his Hebrew speech. He was not only a religious Jewish male, he was a member of their strictest and most self-disciplined sect. He had in his heart a burning zeal for what he thought was the cause of God, and he had a record in Judaism which no one could find fault with. Paul listed all his impressive training, lineage and experiences and then he says it is all a loss. None of it counts. Now when I read this I was sad because I think I have done, as most of us think we have done, some pretty amazing things in our lives. If scripture listed Paul's credentials, why can't there be a list of this Paul's credentials? I view my career and my calling uh, as a calling in my life. In addition to my high school diploma, I have four college degrees. I have served and chaired countless committees at the local presbytery level. I have for years graded the standard ordination exams for the denomination. I have served on special commissions. I have served my community as a sheriff's chaplain. In addition to career, I have accomplished much. I have married the love of my life. I have two children that I am extremely proud of. I do not come from, nor do my children come from a single parent home. And as a man, I don't forget birthdays or anniversaries. On a personal level, I have accomplished much in life because I know how to cook. I know how to clean. I can iron and press my pants. I can iron pleats. I can sew on a button. I can take care of my own lawn, not one of these riding mower things. I can do that. I know how to type. I even know how to drive a car with a manual transmission. 
because I'm a dad, I have been forced to watch all of those terrible Disney programs at night on TV, and I know way too much information about all of those characters. I also have a wild bad boy streak in me, and I have been known to eat raw cookie dough. <laughs> In other words, I have worked hard my entire life to evolve into the person that I am today. And because of who I am, I proudly serve God. But now is St. Paul really saying that all of my accomplishments are lost and what I have done in my life doesn't matter? No, he's not. God makes us who we are for a reason. And I believe that the way we live our lives and the things we are able to accomplish brings a warmth to God's heart. So what does Paul mean? He means that all of our accomplishments are lost compared to what we gain with a life with Christ. Even though, and I can't turn pages. Oh my, everybody's watching, there it is. <laughs> Okay, so where was it? Oh yeah, come lost because of Christ got that. We can become the richest, most famous, most successful, most talented. We can be the kindness, most dedicated, giving, wonderful, and respectful person in the whole wide world. But if Jesus is not the center of our lives, if he is not at the core of our beings, if his living presence does not rule in our hearts, then everything else means nothing. Being in a right relationship with God, with Christ, is the accomplishment to strive for. That is something that we can be proud of. When we can do that, then our lives become full of joy and challenge, success and failure, rewards and hardship, peace and agony. Because being in a right relationship with Jesus does not spare us from the pain and the ugliness that life can bring. A life with God allows Jesus the opportunity to travel alongside us on our faith journey so that we can properly deal with the joys and pitfalls of the life that God has given us. In his book, The Crucifixion of Ministry, Andrew Purvis has this to say, and it's really important anything Andrew Purvis says because he's from Scotland, so you really want to listen <laughs> and buy his books because he's from Scotland. He's good. Jesus is God active in the life of the world, in our personal life, and in all of our ministries. The issue is not how does Jesus get into our ministries. Instead, because he is the living and reigning Lord, the issue is now what is he up to and how do I pitch a ride on whatever he is up to. Our jobs, our careers, our accomplishments are very important to who we are as children of God, but it is secondary to what we gain from knowing who Jesus is and from being an integral part of hitching a ride into what Jesus is doing. Now that we know this, now that I have beaten this concept to death of what is loss and what is gain in Christ, it is also necessary for us to go back to verse 1 of today's passage. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you. It is a safeguard. Why do you think that is important to Paul? Why does he take the time in the middle of this letter to remind his friends to have joy? Well, there are several reasons. First, we should rejoice always because everything in Christ is gain and all else is lost. We've just talked about this. If Jesus comes first and everything else is secondary, then in our lives there should always be time for rejoicing. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Rejoicing is comforting because it proves that the living Christ and the Holy Spirit are dwelling inside of us. Second, if we continually rejoice, we are less likely, we are less likely to complain, to grumble, and to be negative. If our hearts are full of joy, we tend to see things more positively. We tend to give the benefit of the doubt. We tend to be less cynical, less judgmental, and we tend to believe the best out of our community and other people. When the world and humanity can show us 
the worst possible sign of life. When through no fault of our own, life can rear its ugly and life-changing head. When events such as the massacre that we all went through this last week can have us screaming, why God, why? When all of these things happen, we display sorrow, not, not joy. When on the outside we are suffering and we are worried and we are full of fear, we know that on the inside we can rejoice because there is no circumstance, there is no situation, there is no scenario in which God is not by our side, seeing us and loving us through. Third, when others see our joy, it is contagious. It will affect how they behave and live. Being a joyful Christian is a great way for other people to know and love Christ. Now, there was a man, and he was looking for a job. And he noticed that there was a job opening, although it didn't say what it was. There was a job opening at the local zoo. So he decided he would go check it out. And they took him into a room, and this is a very hush-hush, private thing, this job, because the zoo had a problem, they had a dilemma. Their prize-winning, drawing in the crowd, paying all their money, animal, the gorilla, had died. And they had procured another gorilla for the zoo, but it wouldn't arrive for several days. So they had a great makeup artist and a great costume, they needed someone to dress up like a gorilla and take the gorilla's place in the cage until a new gorilla could come. The man thought this was absurd, but he was willing to give it a try because it, it really wasn't a hard job. He just had to eat and sleep and walk around in a gorilla costume for a few days. And the pay was phenomenal. So he decided that he would give this a try. So he gets with the makeup team, he puts on the suit, they do all the finishing touches, and you can't tell the difference between him and a real gorilla. So they put him in the cage and he goes to the back of the cage and he decides to take a nap and sleep or pretend to sleep since he's there to give the people what they want to see. And he does this for about half an hour and he gets bored. So he decides to walk around a little bit, stretch a little bit. And as he's doing that, it draws the attention of some of the people walking by and they stay. So he beats his chest a little bit. He eats a banana a little bit. And the more he does things and the more he naturally interacts with the crowd, the more cheers and applause he gets and the more people that come by. Decides to climb a tree. The people go nuts. He grabs a vine from the tree and he swings from one side of the cage to the other and the people go crazy and more people show up and now he's in his element. He's found his stride and so he starts swinging back and forth and back and forth and when he gets up to the height, the vine breaks and he swings right out of his cage and right next door into the lion's den. Now he has a problem. <laughs> He's about eight feet from a very hungry, very involved looking lion. So he doesn't know what to do. And he does what any human being would do. He does what you and I do. He panics. And he starts screaming, help me, save me from this lion. And he starts yelling, I'm not really a gorilla. I'm just kidding. I'm really a man in a gorilla suit. Somebody save me. But as he's yelling and screaming, the lion's getting closer and closer. And suddenly he pounces and he pins the man to the ground. And the jaws of that great big lion open up and he looks the man right in the eyes and he says, keep your mouth shut, you're gonna get us both fired. <laughs> we can never truly hide who we are. We can't pretend to be someone else. We can't pretend to be something else. We are who we are and people are always going to find out who we are. And that's okay, because who we are are children of God. And we don't have to hide, and we don't have to pretend, and we can take all of our faults and all of who we are to God. We can give God our obedience, we can give God our respect, we can give God our achievements and our accomplishments. As long as Christ is coming first, all will be well, and it will be well now and forever. Amen.
let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much. Please continue to love us and guide us despite of how we treat you and others. May we truly show you respect and obedience now and always. Amen.